Hi, welcome to How to Write Science Fiction That Doesn't Suck. I'm Rick Partlow. For those of you who don't remember me, I've written somewhere on just shy of 58, 59 books now. Uh, I will be at 59 by the end of the year. Um, all of them will have been or are published somewhere. I actually just got uh, a paperback copy of one of my latest. Earth at War Book 6, Allied Powers. It's a nice cover. So today, I wanted to talk about the hook. Now, I cannot claim responsibility for bringing this idea into my thought patterns. I saw a post on a writing message forum by a good friend of mine about the hook. How to hook people into your book. And by this, I'm not talking about a book description. I'm talking about how to begin your book so that people, when they read the sample on Amazon or when they pick it up in the bookstore, if you're lucky enough to be in a bookstore, and they look at the first couple pages, they say, oh my God, I'm going to buy this book and finish it. Because that's what I would do whenever, I, in the old days, pre ebooks. Whenever I went to Amazon, I'm sorry, whenever I went to uh, like Books a Million or Barnes & Noble, I would look at the cover. First, I would look at the title because most of the books you know, were spying out. Some of them were front forward. So I'd look at the title, and then I'd turn it around and look at the cover. If the cover was already revealed. That's a, that was a plus. And then I would read the uh, description. And I will tell you one thing that used to bug the hell out of me is – there used to be a trend uh, of putting like blurbs from other authors on the back of the book instead of a description or on the interior jacket. And I hated that. I wanted to know what the book was about. And if you couldn't take the time to tell me what the book was about, then I probably was not going to buy it unless I really, really liked the author already and just bought anything that they wrote. But I would look at the book description, and if the book description sounded like something I wanted to read, I would uh, pick it up, and I would read the first couple of pages. Maybe if I was, you know, had a lot of time on my hands, I'd read the whole first chapter. And then what I did next, uh, <laughs> there was three things I would do next, and one of them you may consider heresy, or but uh, I would either buy the book based on that. And if, if it was good enough, you know, I usually would just buy it based on that. Or I would uh, not buy it, obviously, because I felt like it wasn't going to be something I liked. Or if I was right on the edge of buying it, but I had a, I had a suspicion that I wasn't going to like it, that, I, that it seemed like one of those depressing books that I generally don't enjoy, I would read the last chapter. Uh, I know that's that's like watching the end of the movie first, but it it was either that or I wasn't going to read the book at all. So if I if I open the last chapter and I'm like, oh, this looks like a cool ending, then I would be willing to commit the time to read the rest of the book. Some of you may think that's that's a wrong. That's but it was either that or or not give the guy my money. So I, I'm sure that the authors. And the publishers didn't mind. So nowadays, things are a little different. Um, obviously, there's still bookstores. But a lot bigger percentage of books are sold online than are sold in stores. So when people look at your description, the description is very, very important. The cover is very, very important. They're going to look at those first. But then you're going to get people who are not sure, and they're going to do the look inside feature on Amazon. I'm not 100% sure that uh, the other retail online retailers have this feature, but Amazon sure does, and they own the biggest share of the book market. So they're going to do the look inside, and they're going to read your first few pages, maybe your first chapter, whatever fits inside your look inside. And by the way, if you're self-published, here's another tip for you. Do not 
include too much front matter. I mean, some front matter is fine, but if you include pages on pages of front matter, and then you're somebody's doing the look inside, and they're, they're scrolling through all that, and they get to maybe the first page of your book, and they're like, well, screw this. You know, the guy not showing me anything about the book, you know, not showing me any of his work. So they may not buy it. I mean, that's, I've experienced that before where the look inside was mostly like ads for other books. Like, forget that. Put that in your back. If you're in control, if you're the one publishing the book, put that in your back matter. Don't stick it in the front of your book. Because when I open up the digital version of this book, you know, I want to see, I've got here also in the series, and then there's there's the first page, you know? So when I get, if I get to the look inside, I should get most of the first chapter of the book in the look inside. Um, and that's what I want. That's what most people want when they do the look inside on Amazon. They want to see what your writing is like. So how to hook people in. First of all, if this is the first book in a series, I mean, if it's a standalone, that's even more important. But most of the people listening to this are going to be writing series. That's how you make money nowadays. Um, so if this is the first book in a series, it's incredibly important that you put your best writing on the first page. You need to, I'm not, I'm not one to take lots of time writing books, write multiple drafts, and I do such a complete outline that I don't need to. But one thing that I will spend time on, I will just look at for a while, and that's why it takes so long to start a book for me, is I want the first page of the first book to grab people. That, that means that you have to have really good writing in the first chapter. You have to have compelling character moments. Uh, if you're writing military science fiction, it helps if you have action in the first chapter, uh, or at least conflict, if not action. Uh, and the difference between that is, I mean, conflict shows you the protagonist, the antagonist of the book. Um, but action would be like, you know, a battle or a fight. So one of those two is helpful to have. Um, honestly, in military science fiction, um, I see too many people, and I have been guilty of this, so I'm not calling anybody out for something I haven't done. When you write 59 books, you're, you're guilty of almost everything at some point. I see too many people doing like a training exercise as their replacement for action, which I don't think works well because there's no stakes in that. You don't know any of the people yet. <coughs> and, <coughs> pardon me, the people involved in the training exercise are going to know it's not real. So you can't go inside the character's head and create stakes by making them think how much how scared they are or how much they hope they see their kids again or whatever. They're just going to be thinking, oh man, I hope I don't screw up and get a bad review after this. You get a bad write-up. So, I, like I said, I've done it, but I haven't done it in the first book of a series. Uh, sometimes I've done it, like on book two, when people already know the characters and could be fooled into thinking the characters are actually in danger. But I recommend against it. Um, another thing I recommend highly against, very, very forcefully against in your first book in a series is putting people in danger who are not the POV characters. If you are doing the first book in a series and you introduce the book with a prologue or a, a section where people die or are put in danger who are not your POV characters and you're never going to see them again, that ticks me off. I don't know how general readers feel about it. I haven't done a poll or anything, 
But I was a reader before I was a writer, and that always ticked me off. I'm like, who are these people? Why should I care about them? Where did they go? How do they fit in the story? And usually you don't find out for 100 pages who they were or how this fits in the story. That's the thing they do in fantasy a lot, and I think it's probably more accepted in fantasy. But in science fiction, I hate it. I, I'm not really crazy about it in other genres that I that I read but don't write, such as um, action, you know, action thrillers, and mysteries. It's you know, mystery. Somebody's going to get killed, and then somebody has to solve it. So, in a mystery or a, a thriller that involves like a serial killer or something, yeah, you're going to have somebody who dies or or is in peril that's not the main character at the beginning of the book. And I understand that. But science fiction is different. Military science fiction is very different. My solution a lot of the time has been to introduce the character in some kind of conflict or action that is prior to them being in the military. Or if they they start the book as already an established veteran, then it's a it's a skirmish or an engagement prior to the main war that takes place in the series. That way you can do some character moments. You can do world building. You can do uh, introduction of uh, the technology involved, um, the travel times, everything that the, that the people there have available to them before you actually jump into a conflict with this new enemy. I think that that works pretty well. It usually won't piss people off because uh, you are do, do character building. You are showing action. You're giving people, you're giving your characters uh, real risk. Maybe you have like a, the main character has a, a good friend who and you devote some time to making them a likable character in that initial battle, and then you kill them off just to show, you know, the stakes are real. But I, that's how I would, I specifically do military science fiction and some space opera. And for military science fiction, that's, a, in my opinion, a very good way to start a new series. Uh, there are other ways, like in uh, Drop Trooper, Cam Alvarez is a, street uh, con artist and he steals drugs and money from gangs. And in the beginning of uh, Contact Front, he stealing uh, drugs and money from a, from a gang and then he gets chased after by one of the gang's hitmen and the guy gets killed and then he gets arrested. So that shows the world. It shows his character. It has action, it has real stakes, um, and it sets everything up. But it's not the war, and he's not in the military yet, but it, it is a, it, it's an action scene. It's a conflict between him and the state because he's doing this in defiance of, of the, the law, and the, he winds up getting arrested. It shows what position he's in. It shows he's not with the gangs. He's like an outsider. It, it positions him as an outsider. <clears throat> um, there are other ways. I mean, space opera, a good way to introduce things in space opera is to have something unknown occur in the beginning, a mystery that has to be solved, for example. But you, the best way to get a good idea of how to do this is to read. Obviously, I've gone into this before. You read successful books by best-selling authors in your genre and your subgenre, and you see how they do it. Um, that doesn't always work because I will share something else with you that's kind of a secret, an open secret, that uh, once authors get successful, they... I don't want to say they get lazy, but they aren't as desperate about it. <laughs> you know, they like 
now nowadays I'm not as I guess I don't want to say desperate. That's not the right word, but you know, intense. Like when I wrote my first few books, I was really intense about getting that first page just right. And you should be. And I still try to, but you know, now that I have a following, I know people are going to pick up my book, even if the first page doesn't hook them as much as like the first page of uh, Birthright did or whatever, or Glory Boy. So sometimes I will do something less intense and more uh, character driven, less, less action. Uh, so you got to be careful when you read successful authors in their later series because they may not be as in as uh, concentrated on trying to make a, a really good hook. They might, they might be, I'm just going to write the story I want to write and I will start it the way I feel like starting it and I have an audience and they're going to read it. Um, so it's probably best to read their earlier books for examples of this uh, before they got really successful. Um, and it, a great hook, I mean, it's always used as an example of a great hook, is in um, Larry Correa's Monster Hunter International. Uh, let's see, I want to, I want to make sure I get this right. So he, the main character is a, an accountant, and he. Um, is working for a guy it turns out to be a werewolf. And uh, let me, I, I'm just going to bring it up on Kindle because I obviously have that book on my Kindle because why wouldn't I? <laughs> Larry Correa is an excellent author and Let's see here. He's an excellent author, and I encourage all of you to read his books. Okay, here it is. On one otherwise normal Tuesday evening, I had the chance to live the American dream. I was able to throw my incompetent jackass of a boss from a 14th story window. That's, his, that's how he opens the book. That grabs you. That's a hook. That's the definition of a hook. And that is a guy who... As the writer, Larry was really, really intent on making a good hook because he wrote that book trying to make that his first published novel. And when that didn't happen, he started selling it independently. Back before there was Kindle, back before there was, you know, KDP, he was selling a, he was selling CDs mail order through a website and selling the books out of his trunk of his car. So he he really had an incentive to make a great hook and a great beginning. And he did. And that's the kind of thing that you want to do, especially if this is your first series, you need to hook people. And you don't just need to make the first paragraph a good hook, like that's a great hook. You need to make the whole first chapter a hook that pulls people into the rest of the book. Like in the first chapter of Monster Hunter International, uh, the guy, the guy's boss turns into a werewolf, which the guy didn't know werewolves existed, tries to kill him, and he manages to throw the boss out the window and kill him. And then he is taken to the hospital, and people from uh, this monster control bureau, I think it is, uh, they come to check to make sure he's not a werewolf. So... Then he knows that there's a bigger world out there, and he's trying to get involved in it. Um, so that really hooked me into the book. I mean, I really wanted to read the rest of it once I read the first chapter. And that's what you need to do. Obviously, most of you are not going to be able to get as good of a hook as Larry did in that book. It's it's not uh, if if anybody could make a hook like that, then Larry wouldn't be you know Larry. But you need to do the best you can. You need to make uh, you need to make that your priority. You need to spend your energy that you that you put into 
your um, your first novel in a series, spend a lot of your creative energy and time in making a great first chapter. Now, if things you know aren't as intense in the uh, in the uh, like the second or the third chapter, if you if you if you take a step back and start building up again, that's fine. Because a book can't be all intense all the time or people will just get worn out. So it's okay to, to go downhill and then back up and then back down. But you need to make that first chapter intense. You need to make it something that's going to grab people. Um, let me read you something. This is the first chapter of Birthright, which I wrote a long, long time ago. I wrote this chapter in the 90s. The ancient shall return. Repent your arrogance, O humanity, and seek their wisdom. I saw the spittle fly from the woman's lips as she yelled her message out at the passers-by on Harris Town's main street. She wore the polychromatic robes of a priestess in the predecessor cult, and from the amplification of her voice, she either had surgically augmented her vocal cords or was wearing some kind of public concealed public address hardware. Her acolytes... A pair of heavily altered males, their muscles augmented with clone tissue almost to the point of absurdity, stood naked beh behind her, arms raised toward the sky. They were chanting some kind of mantra, but I couldn't quite make out the words. I didn't particularly care, except that they had interrupted the news feed I'd been ordering over my Neuralink. I brushed past them, only noticing them all to make sure they didn't notice me. Today it was my job to not be noticed. And then that that was the introduction to that book that's more space opera the military sci-fi um did a lot of world building in just a couple of paragraphs i let you know that these people exist that all this technology exists that the guy's not impressed by it uh, there's a whole lot of that you introduce in, in just one period and that is not honestly my best writing because like i said it's one of the earliest books i wrote <laughs> And that was one of the things that took a while for me to get was how to um, make a good hook. I'm not sure if I really ma mastered that until much later. Um, for instance, Recon, I had, which was uh, the one I did after the Birthright series, I feel like I had a much better hook. Here's Recon Chapter 1. Everything was pain and darkness, and all I could hear was the hollow sound of my own breath against the inside of my helmet. I tried to remember where I was and how I got here, but the thought seems to be hazy and random, just flashes of faces I couldn't identify in settings I didn't recognize. The woods dark and wet, dead twigs and detritus crunching under my boots as I maintained my interval, keeping 10 meters between me and the next Marine in line, scanning the dark with my helmet sensors, infrared and thermal, keeping my Gauss rifle pointed out of the formation. No warning, just light and fire and screaming in my ears, in the headphones of my helmet. Something big and hot and thermal coming in from overhead, and I was shooting at it, knowing I couldn't scratch it even with the tungsten slugs out of my rifle. And then a bright flash, and suddenly I was here, and I didn't know where here was. I decided to start with something simple, my name. Which I think is a better introduction than the one I did in the first book. Uh, so that's something you, get, you will get better at. And uh, maybe you'll publish the first ones, or maybe you'll go back and change them. But it's one of those things when I say, you know, to practice, to keep writing, that's one of the things you could concentrate on. It's an actual, it's not just something vague like, I need to have better characterization, because that could be, mean a lot of things. You get a good hook, you know what that means. You want something catchy, you want something that gets people's attention, and Wants, makes them want to read the rest of the book. Um, it should have conflict. It should have possibly action. It should have enough character development for you to care about the fate of these people. And it should have some world building so you know what kind of a world you're in. Um, I mean, you don't need to info dump. That's not what I'm saying. You... Info dumping in the first chapter is a cardinal sin, and I've done it back in the day. I did it. I admit it. Uh, you know, mea culpa. 
but you shouldn't. That's why I'm giving these, you these videos so you can learn from my mistakes. Don't info dump in the first chapter. Info dump is the opposite of a hook, unless it's something that's so cool that everybody's going to want to read more about it. Don't info dump. Make it mysterious. Make them want to read more to find out what's going on. Only give them enough to entice them. Uh, like in Birthright just then, uh, it's not my best opening, but it does give you a sense of the world they're in. And it tells you, A, they, they can enhance their bodies with uh, biomechanical augmentation. That's pretty far futuristic. And he's not impressed by it, so it's not something new. So that introduces you to the time period you're probably in. Um, said something about the world he's on. He's not on Earth. He's on a colony world somewhere, and it's habitable. So they're somewhere in far enough in the future that there's star travel. All these things are introduced in a couple paragraphs without saying, hey, there's star travel and there's physical augmentation. It just gives you an example of what happened and draws you into the world, hopefully. I don't want to, like, you know, blow my own horn and say that my book was great. It did, it did pretty good. I mean, it made me a lot of money and got pretty good reviews. So by that standard, it was successful. So I feel like that's not a bad example to use. But like I said, I gave you the one with Larry Correa, and that's, that's universally accepted as a great hook to get people into your book. So, okay, I don't want to go too far into this, but I feel like this is a, I wanted to get back into craft because I've talked way too much business lately and I'm getting tired of business. Um, but in a way, this is kind of business because this is something you can use to get people's eyes on your book, to get people who are just this close to buying and haven't made their decision from, yet from your cover and haven't made their decision yet from your description. They make that decision based on the look inside. Or like I said, if you're in the bookstore, you know, read the first few pages. But most likely, if you've gotten to the point where you're in a bookstore, then you've gotten past uh, the acquisitions editor at a traditional publisher, which means they had to be hooked by that first page and that first chapter. So this is something you can work on. Uh, whether you've got a book that's already done or one you're about to start. If you have one that's already done and you haven't published it yet, or even if you have and want to uh, spruce it up and relaunch it if, it, if it's self-published, go back, work on that first page, work on that first chapter. If it's weak, and there's a lot of books that I have read for in indie published and traditionally published, and for people who are just looking to have somebody look at their book. A lot of books, that once I get past the first couple chapters, I'm like, you know, this is a good book. These characters are engaging. The uh, The world is great. I love this book, but the first chapter sucks. And if I had had the choice of buying this book, if this wasn't something I was doing either as market research in my subgenre or as a favor to somebody, I wouldn't buy it because the first couple chapters were not good. There was info dumping. There was, as you know, bobbing. There was people talking about stuff that they would have known and would not talked about in that way. Unrealistic dialogue. All kinds of crap that would make me not buy this book. You need to go back once you finish your book and work on the first chapter. I mean... I don't do it generally much anymore, but like I said, I have a following. I have an audience. I have people that will read the book no matter what. Uh, and I'm not saying I take advantage of that by writing crappy books, but I'm saying I don't have to refine and refine and refine and repolish the first chapter to the point where it's the best work I've ever done every time. Um, for one thing, I practice a lot, so I, I have a sense of what to write. But the other thing is people will read the book and – I don't write bad first chapters, but if, if everyone's not the best one I've ever written, that's okay. But if you are just starting out and you need to get an audience, that's what you need to do. You need to go back and refine that first chapter, specifically the first page, the first thing they see. 
I mean, you really should do the whole chapter or the whole first scene at least, but that first few paragraphs are vitally important. Uh, don't info dump. World build by inference. Have some kind of an action. Have some a bit of character development. Not all character development. Just some mention of the person's character. Um, in contact front, <coughs> I did that with uh, Cam Alvarez in a way that was world building and character development all in one, which and then later went into uh, action. But it's something you should consider. Let's see here. The billboard spewed government lies far above us, and I pretended to listen while I watched the crowd in the Zocalo. Final casualty estimates from what has become known colloquially as the Battle for Mars have yet to come in, but Commonwealth Fleet Admiral Sato has announced the cruiser Midway, which was set to launch from the shipyards there, has been destroyed along with several other ships in the docks for repairs and refitting. The Tawny attack was beaten back at great cost, and fleet resources say it may be sometime before the cruiser's lost and the strike can be rebuilt. The talking head was narrow-faced, short-haired, and androgynous, a computer simulation meant to come across as pleasant and non-threatening, while it told the masses the official story about an alien attack on the solar system that had taken out a good portion of the Commonwealth's military arsenal. Did the government think we were stupid? Did they think if they sugarcoated the news enough, we wouldn't get scared? Watching the cattle shuffling along obediently th through the shops of the Trans Angeles Underground, heads down over their scan sheets, reading the latest celebrity gossip, I decided the government was probably right. So there you have world building. You've introduced a war that's going on. You know that there's an interstellar war. You know something about the technology of the people involved. And you know that the main character is cynical, has a very low opinion of his fellow man and of the government. And that's all in a couple paragraphs. Now, is it perfect? No. Looking at it, I could probably polish it up some more. Um, break in the that news broadcast like halfway with little thoughts or something. You can always, looking back, you always figure out something else you can do. But that's the idea of what you need to do. You need to character build, world build, but put it all into a grabby, snappy, short uh either action or conflict-filled scene. And you need to make it, give a hint of what's to come in the rest of the book. Okay, I've gone on enough about this. Um, if you have books that you have not yet published, if, like at your first book, or if you have a, a book you're thinking about publishing, go back and look at the first chapter. Go back and look at the first paragraph. Have other people read just... Have other people read just – it's hard to get people to read the whole book, obviously. Have them read just the first page and say, how can I make this first page better? Because people will be a lot more likely to tell you, how can I make the first page better than how can I – can you read my whole novel and tell me how to make it better? That's like a weeks-long commitment to reading and making notes. One page, a lot of people will do that for you. So that is my recommendation, and hope you guys are doing good, and hope you had a good Thanksgiving for the listeners in the United States, and have a good Christmas plan to hit. And I will talk to you next time.